So what does the word dominance mean to you? Often when I ask this question, people will come up with words like overbearing, uh, forceful, violent, uh, fighting to be at the top, uh, putting other animals in their place. They come up with these real, quite um, dramatic words, these often violent um, connotations behind them. And actually, if we were looking at the actual definition of the word dominance, we find it's completely different. So if you look at a, a, dic dic a dictionary definition, one of the defi definitions I found in the Collins Dictionary was having primary authority or influence. And I really like the word influence here because it leads us to think that we are guiding um, individuals, people around us. We are um, having authority, but not in a forceful, domineering way. We are um, life coaches, as it were. So the word dominance really over the years has been hugely corrupted. And now when we think about that word, we think about the bad connotations, you know, the, the, the forceful connotations, not the influencing, not the authority over. And you can be authoritative over somebody without using all these overbearing uh, methods. So first of all, let's talk about what we thought we knew, how a wolf pack worked. So we um, only really had information from captive wolves and the study of those captive packs. Up until, you know, 30 odd years ago, it was really hard to watch wolves in the wild. We didn't have things like, you know, the, the, the sophisticated things we have these days, like, like um, radio collars. We weren't able to track them so well, you know, with helicopters or whatever methods it is, the modern methods we used. So we really took on board the research that was done. So we thought, um, and these thoughts came from studies done by a, a man called uh, Rudolf Schenkel back in the 30s and 40s, and he did uh, what we, he called um, the study of expressions of, of wolves. Basically, he was looking at body language and communication skills. But it was from these studies that the terms like alpha and beta and omega were coined. This is where, where we first saw them. The problem with this pack that he studied was there was a huge group of individual adult wolves that were all living together in a tiny enclosure. And most of the studies were done in breeding season because that's when he saw the most body language happening. Um, and it really, I kind of liken it to the big brother effect. You put a whole load of individuals together that shouldn't be living together in a very small space and you'll wait for the drama to happen. And his study actually was a brilliant study. It, it, it was very truthful. It told us exactly what the wolves were doing. And having worked with uh, socialised packs, captive packs myself, I can say absolutely what he said happens. However, it's not what happens in real world. So from those studies, they thought that wolves came together and formed a pack only in breeding season and that they all fought for the right to breed. Um, and then the two who emerged at the top, the, uh, the female and the male that emerged from the top, they'll be the ones that breed and then we'll bring out the puppies. And we know that absolutely doesn't happen in the wild we know it's mum dad and the kids uh, and it's a unit that's very similar to our units our human families but of course because we've only had these captive studies that's where all of these um we you know people blame all of these things that we do on that study actually it's not true actually a lot of the practices that we still believe that we should do with dogs came from before then First of all though, let's look at how a wild wolf pack operates uh, and I'll give you a kind of an overview of a, wild, of a wolf pack. So a wolf pack can differ in, differ in size greatly. So a pack is normally named when researchers, uh, say for example in Yellowstone Park, uh, there'll be two individuals and the first year they breed and have cubs, then they'll get a, a wolf pack name as it were. But a pack can be anything from two individuals up to uh, many individuals. Uh, and there have been some recordings of packs that have been up to 30, 40 uh, wolves within that pack. They've not been sustainable, they've not lasted very long, but they have worked for a while. The normal size of a pack probably averages about seven individuals, but it's fluid because 
you'll get cubs born in the spring, you'll get yearlings that will disperse for the summer, then come back for the winter, you'll get older wolves dying, you might get um, other wolves coming and joining the pack. So it is a fluid uh, movement. Normally, all the animals in that pack um, aren't related. So obviously mum and dad aren't related. They've been probably two wolves dispersing from separate packs and they've met, have found a territory and started to breed. Um, and everyone else basically is their offspring. Um, there'll be different situations as well where different wolves will take the lead in some situations. So for example, it might be mum and dad who just starts to you know, tell people we need to go out for hunts, you know, to hunt some food. But there may be an individual within that pack that is better at tracking or some individuals that are better at bringing the prey down. So you'll find that they'll take different roles at different times. Um, everybody knows their, their, their role within the, the pack and it can change daily as well. So you'll get every individual in the pack might stay home and, look and babysit the cubs when they're too young to go out and, and, and go around the territory to, to find food. They might stay in the den or they might stay in what we call rendezvous view sites. So um, a place where they leave the cubs, go off to hunt and then come back to them or then come back and take the cubs to the kill. Um, one of the great things about wolf packs as well is they rarely inbreed because by the time the girls are sexually mature at 10 to 22 months, they normally have, have uh, dispersed from the paternal or the paternal pack. So they're not with mum and dad anymore. Um, very rare does it happen that they will uh, inbreed uh, with related wolves. Usually that will happen within captivity or, you know, there's a, a reason why wolves can't disperse or for whatever reason it happens. But it, it has been recorded, but it's very, very rare because obviously not good for genetics and the kind of continuation on of healthy individuals. Like I say, it's a really ordered group. Everybody knows the job. Everybody knows what they're doing. There's very little aggression because that means if you've got aggression and you've got an unstable pack, it doesn't function. It doesn't work. It doesn't thrive. It will break down. Um, it's just not good for business. It just doesn't happen. You know, we know ourselves, our family units work most of the time. If they don't, if there is problems, then they, they fragment, they break down. Um, and nobody gains anything from that. So you have to stop thinking about wolves as being really aggressive towards each other, fighting to be, you know, the breeding pair, always putting other wolves in the place. It just doesn't happen in the world. You know, uh, they may look like sometimes they're having a big Barney, but what they're actually doing is what we call ritualized aggression, which is normal. It's a bit like our bickering. Um, if there was a big problem in the pack, you know, you would get injurious uh, fights happening and it's very rare that you actually get a wolf that will m cause a blood injury to another wolf. If that happens, it's probably because there's a massive problem um, and in that case, you probably would fight till that wolf was seriously injured or even killed. It just doesn't happen, rarely in wild. Why you live in a pack would be because actually cooperation is much easier to live, isn't it? We know that if we've lived on our own, it's really hard because you have to do the washing, do the cleaning, do the shopping, put the bins out. You know, you have to do everything on your own. You're more vulnerable because you're living on your own. So, you know, you, you lack that protection of living within a group. You know, obviously with wolves, what they want to do is work together as a team. They're protecting a territory. That territory really is the source of their food, so it's really important that they have that territory. If they're working together, they can continue the pack, so everybody wants their genes to be, um, you know, sent off down the line, as it were. We want our family names to continue. They want their, their, their pack to continue after they've passed on. Companionship is really, really important just for us you know wolves and dogs are social animals they don't do well on their own rarely will you see an animal that prefers to be on their own than in a group and what they do is they live in what we call a qualified democracy which basically means the leaders are leaders because they're allowed to be leaders because they're doing a good job so what i saw in captive wolf packs a lot is if you had um, a wolf who 
who looked like they were the leader, they were kind of the more, and I'm gonna use the word dominant because that, that is the true word to use. If they were bullying, if they were what we would call a bullying alpha, uh, and again, in wolf packs, we can call them that, um, and I'll explain when we, when we don't use those terms a little, little bit later on. But if they are bullying and they're constantly kind of insecure at their job and they're putting other walls in their place, the other walls aren't gonna stand for it for long. You know, they often will depose that individual and they'll replace them with someone who thinks is going to lead that, that group better, to do a better job. To give you an example um, of two females that uh, wolves that I've worked with, one of which was a brilliant leader. She was able to control everyone in her group with looks, with slight body language, with slight vocalisations. Everyone deferred to her. She was brilliant at keeping the group in order. She was calm, she was confident, she did a really good job. She very rarely had to assert her authority than any more than a look, a stare, a vocalization. Then there was another female in another group and she was really insecure and we call her a bullying alpha. And she spent her whole time trying to put everyone else in their place. And the pack completely did not thrive at all. They were really seriously in trouble uh, to the point where I had to step in and do something about it and I ended up neutering all of them to help kind of calm it all down. So there's just two individuals that work very differently. And it's really interesting because what we term as the bullying alpha is actually what dominance trainers do to their dogs. They constantly think they have to put them in their place, that they have to be forceful. And all those words we were talking about before that, before that people think what dominance means now. But actually, when you are a good leader, when you are a confident leader, you're very, very calm, very aloof. You don't have to do much to discipline everyone in your group. Everybody knows you, knows their place within that group. Everything is stable. We need the stability in that group for it to thrive. Um, so remember those two individuals because they're really important to, to you know, how we kind of ourselves deal with our dogs and our packs on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm.